the people that were being crucified and uh, it talked about the breaking the legs of, of those that were first. Now, we really didn't hit this much this morning, but uh, a Sunday ago, we kind of we went over a little bit of this, but really, as you think about this, um, in verse 32, when it says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him, um, what they would do when they were crucified, um, it's, it's pretty gross the way that would be, right? They'd be hanging and they could lift themselves up a little bit and uh, continue to breathe. And what they would do is they would break their legs so that they couldn't lift themselves up in essence, right? So that they would then uh, suffocate in essence uh, from their own weight hanging on the cross. Um, now that's, the, that's what they would have done normally. But they didn't do that to Jesus Christ, right? As we talked about, they didn't do that because there's actually the scriptural indication that a bone of him shall not be broken. And uh, all the, it just amazes me that all the way down to that fine grain detail, you know, Jesus Christ had already died. And when they got to him and would have broken his legs, they was already dead just to make sure run a spear through his side, all of those things, right? Now it fulfills the verse about they'll look on him whom they have pierced. And so, so much of what happened to Jesus Christ as he's hanging on the cross uh, is fulfilling prophecy and then uh, not having a bone broken and then being pierced. We, we talked a few Sundays ago, right, about the fact that and I'll get to the burial here in just a second. But uh, we talked a few Sundays ago about the fact that if, if, the, if the Jewish people would have carried out the execution themselves, it probably would have been a stoning. But then that would not have fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus Christ himself gave about being lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. It also, the stoning, if you've understood the Jewish first century stoning stuff, he probably would not have made it out of that without broken bones. Well, then he wouldn't have been able to fulfill the prophecy about not a, a bone of him would be broken. And then, of course, in this instance, the other two people hanging beside him, they have their legs broken, but not him. Very specific, very detailed, as you look at the Gospels about how Jesus Christ fulfills each and every part that needs to be fulfilled. In verse 35, it talked about the one that had saw it and that it was fulfilling the scripture in verse 36 about a bone of him that should not be broken. In verse 37, and again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So all the way down through this, you see time and time and time again where it should have went another way, but it didn't. The Jews, for the sin that he had done, they would have stoned him. They didn't. They wanted to go through the Romans to get it done. Well, that fit. They would have broken his legs, but they didn't. Because they didn't break his legs, they used a spear, and now he's been pierced. And now he fits all of those things uh, that have been prophesied about him. In verse 38, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about Joseph of Arimathea here for just a minute. Uh, we see that after Jesus Christ has been hung on the cross, uh, Joseph uh, comes to Pilate and asks for permission. Uh, other chapters use the word begged the body or this idea of pleading with Pilate that they might have the body of Christ. And so we want to take just a minute and look at some of the other Gospels and see what else we can pick up about this Joseph of Arimathea. And you don't have to turn here. I'll just read these real quick. But in Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 60, it says, When the even was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who, was also, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And, when, and he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had, wrapped, had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So in Matthew, 
uh, you hear this phrase, a rich man. So Joseph of Arimathea was not a poor man. Uh, he was a rich man. We find in both Gospels that he was a disciple of Jesus. Uh, and we find in also in Matthew, this is important to keep in mind, also in Matthew, in verse 60, this idea that it was actually his own tomb, his own sepulcher that Jesus Christ was laid in. It said it was a, his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock and rolled a great stone to the door. Matthew chapter 15 uh, starting around verse 42 is when, again, you would pick up the rest of this. In verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly into Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Uh, and then in Luke, Luke chapter 23, and behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just the same had not consented to the council and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. So in these couple chapters, in these couple uh, gospels, uh, you learn that he was an honorable counselor and that he waited on the kingdom of God. In other words, he was looking forward in faith to the coming of the kingdom of God. You find in Luke uh, where it says that he was a counselor, a good man, and a just man. And you also find that he did not consent to the counsel and the deed that they did. It, it's, it's believed that Joseph was probably one of, the, uh, one of the Sanhedrin. He was probably one of the counsel. When it talks about him being a, a counselor, a wise and an honorable counselor, and the very fact that it called out the fact that he did not consent to what they were doing, all of those things would seem to indicate that this was actually um, a man that sat on the Sanhedrin, a man that sat on the council, uh, the very group responsible for taking and falsely accusing and taking Jesus Christ and turning him over to the Romans. So you, f you learn a few things. He was a good man. He was a just man. He did not agree with what the council had done. He was probably a member of that council, and he was also a rich man. And the tomb that Jesus Christ was buried in was the very tomb of Joseph. It was his tomb in his little garden area, uh, it seems to be the indication. Okay. Of course, again, back in John... Um, we read this already, but I'll read a few more verses. Verse 38, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen, Cloths with the spices, as the manner of the Jews was to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There they laid Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross. We're coming up to this special day, this time of preparation. Uh, everybody wants these bodies down off the cross, and, and we could get into the whys and all of that there. But understand that Joseph, it seems, Joseph and Nicodemus, they come together, and they, take, they have the body of Jesus Christ taken down. They've got to hurry because there isn't much time left, right? The preparation is coming. Um, they take this body... They, they wrap it in white linen, they get spices and aloe, and uh, this is no, uh, you look at the, the, the weight of some of this stuff that Nicodemus brought, this is, this is not an inexpensive uh, affair here, but they're, they're basically preparing the body of this one that they are disciples of. And in a lot of ways, you think about this, both of these men seem to have been disciples of Jesus Christ, right? It was Nicodemus, and especially for you kids, right? Do you remember Nicodemus? What, what do we think about when we think about Nicodemus? Nicodemus is the one that came to Jesus by night, right? 
And it's in that dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus Christ that we get some of the most memorized verses in the scripture. I've often talked about in this, as we go through the book of John, about the reference to being lifted up as the, as the serpent in the wilderness was. We can talk about John 3.16. Do any of you know John 3.16? I'm looking at some of my own daughters, hoping they're paying attention. Do you guys know John 3, chap John chapter 3, verse 16? Well, let's go look at it then. I, I, I'm hearing a few... I'm hearing a few, what is that one? Which one is that one? Well, let's go read it. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What about this whole thing about being born again? Have you guys ever heard that one? Being born again? All of those things come from a conversation with a guy by the name of Nicodemus. And so here, at the end of Jesus' ministry, he's just died on the cross. And these two men, both of whom I believe are on the council, both of them I believe are well-known Jewish rulers of the time, both of whom I believe, based on what we're told about them, were people that had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, but, but they were still in this category of, they were followers, they were disciples, they believed his teachings, but man, they didn't make it public because they knew the ramifications of that, right? And they feared. What happens lots of times whenever we have a lot of earthly position and title and treasure, so to speak, suddenly some of that stuff can become very hard to keep if it's publicly known that you're a follower of this one, Jesus. These men had much to lose in a public recognition of Jesus Christ. And it says they were disciples, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Now, there really isn't much said about these gentlemen after this. It seems as if, I'm just going to say it, it seems as if I'm not sure that they're devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ could stay secret after this event. If you know the story, the Jewish rulers knew where the body of Christ ended up. Because it's actually the Jewish rulers who come to Pilate and talk about, maybe you should put a guard over this tomb because when this deceiver was, was alive, he claimed that he would raise from the dead. It's interesting to me that Jesus' enemies remember those statements when his own, his own apostles and disciples didn't seem to remember those statements. But in some of the other Gospels you find that it was, it was some of those people that came, to the, that came to Pilate and said, maybe we should post a guard. They knew where he was buried. And whose tomb was it? We know when we read, I think it was Matthew or Mark, one of those two, it said, hey, there's this rich man by the name of jo Joseph of Arimathea. And it was in his tomb, in his garden, that he had hewn out this place where they buried the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible doesn't really say, but when you look at the context of that and that he went in to the governor and pleaded the body, seemed to have taken a very active part in taking this body, wrapping this body, and then burying it in his own prepared sepulcher, in his own tomb. I'm not really sure that his secrecy of his discipleship of the Lord Jesus Christ was so much of a secret after this. The Bible doesn't really say, but it seems to me it'd be hard to pull all this off without uh, your devotion to this one that they've just crucified showing through. I don't know what happened to Joseph, and I don't know what happened to Nicodemus, but I can tell you this, um, the ramifications from a financial perspective, from a business perspective, from a, uh, your, your seat on the council and all this other stuff would have definitely been in jeopardy. These men, they were not taking a small risk to show this public devotion to this one. I mean, think about it. 
you're supposedly on the council that just did all this stuff. <laughs> and they didn't, I mean, you saw, I mean, I'm telling you what, you saw it when we went through it. They weren't afraid to break the rules in order to get this done. Let's take him by night. Let's have a pre-trial of a pre-trial. And then let's have the pre-trial. And then let's take him and have false accusers and all this other stuff, right? These men, uh, in, in a lot of ways, I'm sure, were taking some pretty big risks by doing what they did. Both of these men came and they worked on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and they wrapped it and they prepared it they prepared spices and they put it in a tomb had the stone rolled in front of it and we know eventually uh, probably pretty shortly thereafter uh, Pilate uh, gave permission to have guards posted let's make sure nobody steals this body we want <laughs> you know what the Jews wanted most they wanted to make sure that body stayed in the ground. We do not want that body disappearing. Now we know, of course, that that's exactly what happened. And it didn't matter what they tried to do, just like it didn't matter how hard they tried to destroy the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing that they could do that was going to keep this from happening. You could have posted as many guards as you wanted to. You could have came along and not just placed a seal on that tomb. You could have cemented that thing shut. It would not have mattered. Lord Jesus Christ, in three days, was going to come up out of that grave. I'm thankful that he did. Now, as we think about this, again, I want each of us, we have went through the book of John, which didn't focus much on his early life, but it focused on the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, his public ministry. We've listened and we've heard about how they treated him. We've heard about how that he suffered and died on the cross. And now we're to the point where he has died. He's been taken off of that cross and he's been put in a tomb. It's interesting. It says that it was Joseph's tomb. It says it was a new tomb. It said it was a tomb that no man had ever been laid in. If you understand a little bit about those, sometimes, if I understand it right, there might be multiple people buried in a tomb like that. What the Jews did, my understanding, is they, would, they might bury you, and then after a year or so, when your body had kind of decayed and stuff like that, they would come back and they would collect the bones, and they would put them in a small, smaller, uh, I say device, but a smaller box that would then be kind of put in a, in, a, in a separate area. So it was not, um, it was possible that a single tomb could contain multiple bodies. Okay? It's interesting that it was where there was no man had ever been laid. I, I read one commentator and he said, isn't it neat how it, it specifies that there were no other bodies in there. It was new. There were no other bodies. Nobody had ever been laid in there. In other words, it's not up for debate which body came up out of that tomb. There was one, and one only. Such detail. I mean, think about the level of detail that goes into this account of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and his burial, and then as we get into his resurrection, all the way down to the point of saying, look, it was a new tomb. Nobody had ever been in there. Nobody, nobody else is coming up out of that grave. Oh, and by the way, it was the tomb of a rich man. And I keep saying that. You know, like, why does he keep saying that? Because what I want you to be thinking about is in the life of Jesus Christ, whether it's in the book of John or the other Gospels, over and over and over and over again, even down to some small, minute details, Jesus Christ fulfills so much. It's so amazing when you start to look at it how detailed the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ, who he was, and what he was going to do. Now, what I want you to do, if you would, I told you this morning that we're going to go over to a, a, a specific chapter, and we're going to read this chapter, and I want you to be thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ as you read this. Now, you can go ahead and turn there. It's Isaiah chapter 53, and there's a couple different places you could turn, but I'm going to do this one, Isaiah chapter 53, 
and before we do that, I'm going to go through this little exercise and uh, just, just think about it in your mind, okay? And, and even the young ones, right? This is not just for adults. As you think about the, the, the kids, how many times have you heard in Sunday school and preaching and all these other things, right? I know, I know the curriculum that some of you guys use in school, so I'm, I'm even going to say in some of your schooling, you've heard about the life of Jesus Christ. We have just spent months and months and months going through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's start at the very beginning. What's different about the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about it. You don't have to answer, but I want, every, I want each one of us to have something in the mind. If we go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to his birth, what's something different? Well, he's born of a virgin. Okay? Now, that may not be in this chapter, but in this book, Isaiah, you're going to see references to the fact that he was going to be born of a virgin. But what else? Was he born in a great, big palace? My buddy Elliot, always sitting on here in the front row, we talk about him getting his feet washed. Was, was Jesus Christ born in this big palace with great riches? Nope. He wasn't, was he? Did he have rich parents? Nope. He was the son of a carpenter. By the way, not just any carpenter, a carpenter from Galilee. Now, if you're, if you're of the elite in Jerusalem, some carpenter's son from Galilee is not real high on your list of important people. He doesn't hold much earthly stature. He, he, he's not somebody that you're going to look at and from a worldly perspective say, I want to be friends with him because it's going to get me a long way in life. As you think about the book of John, he was constantly going back here, back there, over there, over here. And even in some of the Gospels, it talks about, if you're going to follow me, you're not going to have much. The foxes have holes. I didn't have a place to put my head down. What happened? Do you guys remember? When he was born... Okay, so he wasn't rich. He wasn't born to rich parents. He wasn't born in a big palace. Was there a whole bunch of fanfare at his birth? Well, you know, a few wise men. The slaughter of all the kids in, in and around Bethlehem. But in regards to from this worldly perspective, no parades, no shouting for joy, no... Uh, crowds amassing to see the Savior coming into the world, right? Quietly, off to the side, not even at the town that his parents lived in, but even in the birth of where he was at was a fulfillment of Scripture, even though they were just kind of passing through. So what are we saying? I'm saying Jesus Christ in and of himself physically speaking, was nothing that stood out. He wasn't some rich, powerful... figure that everybody was just naturally drawn to because of his looks or because of his influence. How was he treated in his life? Do you remember? Well, in John, we learned that a lot of people hated him. There were multiple times where they wanted to stone him, and he had to leave. There were times where his own brothers were going to go down 
to Jerusalem, and they mocked him. He had to go to Jerusalem in secrecy because they were spreading the word. You find him, you tell us, because we want him. You think about the times, what happened? What happened when he fed? You kids remember when he fed the 5,000? Now, I know every kid in this room has to remember that because what kid doesn't dream about unending supply of food? Maybe that was just me. Maybe none of you do that. But listen, the Lord Jesus Christ took all of this crowd of thousands of people, he took this handful of food, and he turned it into enough food to feed every single one of them and had food left over, right? But do you remember what happened? They wanted to make him king. And then he left, and they followed him because they wanted to make him king. And then they started hearing a little bit more specifics about what he was teaching. And by the end of that chapter, the very people that were thrilled that he could make all this food, the very people that wanted to make him king, it seems like by the end of that chapter, they wanted to stone him. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The apostles abandoned him. The Jewish rulers created false witness and testimony against him, and the Romans crucified him. That was his life. His life was one of, in a lot of ways, poverty. Self-sacrifice for those around him and hatred and bitterness and betrayal in return. So read Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I just described to you some of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, even before he was dying on the cross, even when he did do something that would draw people to him, when they would hear what he had to say, man, they wanted to stone him the next time they talked to him. He was despised. He was rejected. Verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You know, some of the very people I believe that witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross later realized what they had done. And in Acts, when, G when Peter was preaching to them, you see him declare, you have delivered the innocent blood. You've done this. And their return cry was, basically, we've sinned. What, what can we do? I believe some of these people were saved. And you look at these verses, and it says, He's borne our griefs, He's borne our sorrows, yet did we esteem Him stricken. Some of these people looked at Him and they said, Well, let God help Him because He claimed He was of God. Why don't God get Him down off the cross? He was suffering for them, and all they could do was mock Him. We esteemed Him smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5, it wasn't God's punishment upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't that Jesus was smitten of God because of something he had done. But it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What did we say he was? He's the Lamb of God. He's the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. 
but we also know that he went willingly and died on the cross. He bore our sins. He bore our griefs. The things that we've talked about that he suffered, mockery, shame, uh, pain and anguish, God's turning away from him because of the sin that he was taking upon himself, all of those things are things that we should have suffered. But way back here in Isaiah chapter 53, way back here in Isaiah, it described that he was going to do all of these things for us. Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you know what we did? We went away from God. Do you know what we do? We try to get as far away from the light as we can. Do you know what we are? We are wicked, sinful people. That's what we are. But our iniquity was laid upon him. I know that the apostles and probably Joseph and probably Nicodemus, they would look at Jesus Christ and they would think this is the everlasting Messiah that has come to redeem Israel, that has come to set us back, to free us from Rome, and to create an everlasting kingdom. That's what they would have thought. When it said that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God, if you were a first century Jew, when you thought about the Messiah, you would have thought about the one that was coming up to set up an everlasting kingdom. But it says here that he came to bear our iniquities. That our iniquities were put on him. Chapter 53 are the things that he was going to suffer because of us. There is coming a time when he will come back and rule this world as a king. And then eventually, when all of this is destroyed, we'll have an eternity with him. And there will be an everlasting kingdom. But what he came to this earth for was to pay for your and my sins. Verse 6, that's us, right? We've all gone astray. Not a single one of us is any good. Not a single one of us deserve what he did for us. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so opened, he openeth not his mouth. Kids and adults, but I always say kids. I know it's hard sometimes when I get up here and I speak for 45 minutes straight or 50 minutes or sometimes an hour. And we've covered a lot of ground. Right? We've talked about a lot of stuff. But the Lord Jesus Christ did this for you. Lord Jesus Christ suffered shame and anguish and death and the turning away of the Father because of your sin. Do you remember what his defense was? If you guys get taken to court for something you didn't do, all right, Jasmine, you stole my car, my new car. You stole my new car, and I think I can prove you did it, and you're going to go to jail. Would you put up a defense? Would you try to prove that you didn't steal my car? Yeah. Do you know in Isaiah chapter 53, long before Jesus Christ was ever born, it said that he's going to suffer and die because you're a sinner? And he's not only going to suffer and die because you're a sinner, but when they try to take him, he is going to go willingly. It's going to be like leading a lamb to the slaughter. That lamb is going to act like it doesn't know any different, like it doesn't know any better. It's going to follow along, right along, all the way up to the point 
where its throat is slit and it bleeds to death. That's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ could have called legions of angels to come and take him away. His own apostles were willing to take up swords and defend him, and he stopped them. Whenever they took him before Pilate, he wouldn't even defend himself. Pilate even said, don't you know? Like, why are you not saying anything? Don't you know that I'm the one that can let you go or I'm the one that can have you crucified? Jesus' only defense was you couldn't do anything if God didn't let you do it. I hope you're beginning to see how perfect of a picture, how perfectly Jesus Christ fulfilled what was going to be needed for you and me to have redemption. He opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so openeth not his mouth. My example of Jasmine stealing my car, she could probably pretty easily defend that. She's not old enough to drive. She couldn't reach the pedal. She wasn't there when it was gone. Whatever, right? She could defend that pretty easy. Jesus Christ, if, they, if, if Jesus Christ didn't want to willingly die on the cross, they would have never taken him. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. You know what that verse is saying? That verse is saying he's going to die. When it says that he was taken out of the land of the living, he's going to suffer and he's going to die. The apostles and the others, when they looked at him and they looked for that Messiah, and he even tried to tell them a few times, they still didn't get the fact that he had come to die. Not to raise up a kingdom that would overthrow Rome. He came to die. Could he have overthrown Rome? Absolutely. Anybody that can heal the dead, walk on the water, calm the storms, make food out of nothing, there's no army in the world that can stand against that. But that's not why he was here. Listen to this. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, interestingly enough, when you think about Jesus Christ, he was made as a transgressor, and he was hung between two thieves. His death was surrounded by the wicked. And his grave was the grave of a rich man. And what does that say? And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Down to tiny, minute details of what was going to happen to the Lord Jesus Christ, including the fact that his death was going to be surrounded by those that were wicked, and his tomb was going to be involving a rich, the rich. It goes on in verse 9, Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Through the death of one, through the death of one, many would be justified. It's interesting that Caiaphas, who was one of the very ones that was prominent in having the Lord Jesus Christ crucified, him and of himself basically said, isn't it better that one die than the many? Now that's not what he meant. But the Bible tells us that the Lord used his words to prophesy of what was about to happen. And even his words had already been said long ago that the one 
would suffer for the many. The Lord Jesus Christ died that many might be justified. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, but he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressor. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died. He bore your agony. He bore your grief. He bore your pain. He bore your sin. And he made it possible that you could be justified and stand before God sinless, redeemed, forgiven. He did it while the world made him out to be a transgressor. He could have defended himself. He could have either overthrown them. He could have proved that they were wrong. He didn't do any of that. Yet he quietly suffered and died. And when he was done, he uttered those words, It is finished. And you think about when he said that this morning, we talked about it is finished and some of the things that he meant and how he fulfilled statements to Adam and Eve and statements to Abraham and some statements to David and he fulfilled the picture of the Passover lamb let me tell you what he also completely fulfilled Isaiah chapter 53 Isaiah chapter 53 is a perfect picture of what Lord Jesus Christ was doing hanging on that cross he was bearing your sins he was bearing your pain your grief he was taking all of that on because of what you are He did it so that you might not be counted as a transgressor. It says that he was counted among the transgressors. He did what he did so that you could stand before God, not counted guilty, but counted forgiven, redeemed, purchased by the perfect blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. No other way that you could have redemption. No other way that you could find a means to stand in the presence of God but he did it for you. He did it for me. We know from some other passages that we read this morning even, when it talks about him being, uh, you know, no form nor comeliness at the beginning of this chapter, the creator of this world was made less than the angels. And we could even argue that not just less than the angels, but I talked about the fact that his form or his position in this life was even almost like the, the low of the lows, right? Born in, or uh, lived in Galilee and son of a carpenter, didn't have much. He gave up everything so that we could have redemption. One whole chapter in Isaiah is dedicated to this idea that he would come, he wouldn't be anything fancy, he wouldn't be anything that the world was looking for. The world would reject him, the Lord would deny the Lord the world would deny him, the world would persecute him, the world would oppress him. And then he would willingly go and he would suffer and his life would be cut away. He would be cut out from the living because of your sin. And now, when somebody repents and trusts and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, their sins are washed away, gone. And they can stand before a holy, just, just perfect God because they've been covered by the blood of the Son. It's again that great picture of that Passover lamb. Death is coming. Judgment is coming. But when that death angel passed over, when it saw the shed blood on that door, it passed over. That's the picture. God's judgment is not going to be called down on us because we're covered by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Isaiah 53, written many, many years before Jesus Christ was born, 
described it in great detail what he was going to do for us. John may have left out some stuff the other Gospels picked up, but what John focuses on so much, and we're going to see this in the next chapter, the, the next chapter actually tells us, these things were written so that you might know that Jesus is the Son of God. John covers in great detail this is him. There's no mistaking it. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And if it hasn't sunk in yet, he just died on the cross because you're a transgressor and he took your place. Should have been Barabbas hanging on that cross. Barabbas was guilty. <laughs> but Jesus Christ hung there in his stead. You could say it another way. It should have been you hanging on that cross. But Jesus took your place. Jesus Christ died that you might have redemption. All right, we're going to stop there. Brother Philip, if you would, come and lead us in a song. Appreciate your attention. In the next couple chapters, we're going to get into some... Uh,